Rasmus, Chief Experience Officer at Agilic, and it's now on screen. He's going to tell us how to avoid being sacked when using hyper personalization. Intriguing. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, so this is my session, Inspired Not Fired. Uh, and uh, as we were briefly told, this is about how to uh, avoid being sacked when using hyper personalization. First of all, one of my favorite topics, uh, a bit about myself. Uh, I'm Rasmus Holin. I'm Danish, as you may hear on my accent. Uh, I'm the Chief Experience Officer with the MarTech company Agilic. I'm also the author of the Omnichannel book, Make It All About Me. Uh, and I actually intend to give away at least the first chapter for free if you are interested in the the more um, yeah uh, the more long haired parts of uh, omnichannel marketing. I suppose there's a lot of long haired things going on at the moment with lockdown. Besides the point, um, anyway, feel free to connect with me. Um, as a side note, I think I'm the one in our financial report with the with the funniest picture as well. I'd like to think that, anyways. Never mind. On to the hyper personalization part. Um, we know that Gartner predicts 80% of marketers will abandon personalization efforts by 2025. And I think that's an intriguingly high number. Uh, and why, not, why may that be the case? Well, uh, they state that it's because the market has failed to deliver consistent and uh, satisfactory, satisfactory ROI uh, on their uh, personalization efforts. And um, so I interpret this as a, as, a, as a clear sign that the days of having blind faith in personalization and the notion that it'll just continuously bring you more value if you just personalize more, those days are uh, definitely over. And uh, this is where hyper-personalization actually can become quite dangerous uh, because personalization does play a central part in the awesome central dilemma for marketers today. So what would that dilemma be? Well, the way that we look upon it uh, here in Agilic is that the biggest dilemma that we're facing within marketing at, at the moment is actually when you are uh, faced as a marketer with a limited amount of resources, you will have to choose where on this axis from high, high scale to high relevance, where to actually double down uh, if you have a specific activity. So if you go far left, well, and do mass marketing, you'll instantly reach a large amount of people who quickly make up their minds whether to engage with you or ignore you. If you go to the far right, you'll reach fewer people, but they'll have a much better customer experience and a larger share of these people will choose to engage and potentially convert if that's what you're after. So those uh, who've been working with this um, uh, by themselves uh, and uh, in an everyday uh, work scenario. You also know that when you start working with this on a more ongoing basis, you can say this ax axis kind of breaks apart uh, in the middle. Uh, so over to the left, you have the campaigns that are mostly following the yearly cycle. This is where you have a lot of reach, but you're struggling to, to get relevance. Uh, in the, on the other hand, you have all the custom lifecycle based activities that are driven by the, the, the customer data and the interactions and the behavior of your customers. Uh, so you can say with, with the campaigns, reach is often good. Results are almost instant. Uh, bad customer experience, though, for, for many of the recipients uh, in the receiving end of the campaigns. Personalization requires quite a lot of work. Creative work has to be reinvented time and time again. On the other hand, it's a known task that many marketers are familiar with, and it's how most marketers were schooled uh, way back then. Uh, the customer lifecycle part, though, it's a new task for many marketers. So just coming up with ideas that that sort of surpass the the occasional uh, abandoned basket email uh, can be quite challenging for most. We do have advice on that, though, should you be interested. Uh, setting up each automated customer lifecycle flow can indeed be hard work, but uh, scale increases incrementally with each flow you, that, you, uh, did, that you deliver and that you set up. So, of course, delivering a lot of flows, having a lot of customer lifecycle flows, tapping into all those moments of truth is what will drive you automated value uh, in the long term. So how does this relate to being sacked uh, with a hyper-personalization? Well, hyper-personalization will get you sacked if on your campaigns you are working with two granular customer segments. That means that you have to do creative content for each uh, segment, and this will bring you a, a lot of work, which doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get return on investment on that uh, content effort. Also, you'll have to struggle in an omnichannel world with replicating content across channels or even languages if you're working uh, across multiple uh, geographical um, uh, zones. Uh, also, replicating the personalization rules across channels is something that you'll have to deal with. And actually, the uh, Japanese invented a word for this called karoshi. It means death by overwork. I like to call it, refer to it as death by campaign. I'm sure many marketers uh, can uh, actually relate to this. So on the lifecycle flows and on the customer lifecycle communication, you can also get sacked. So what does hyper-personalization mean here? 
Well, it means that if you are doing too many lifecycle flows that reach only very few customers, actually getting the ROI, getting the numbers in terms of money to stack up will take you too long time. Also, if you are delivering too few lifecycle flows too slowly, this can mean that you'll be failing on delivering uh, the ROI that you're looking for. Also, if you just have a boss or you're in a situation where you need to, to provide uh, big results right here and now um, just to, to save the quarter uh, or whatever, then you also, uh, you, you also might find yourself in a situation uh, where you are getting sacked. So what is it that we need here? Actually, the Japanese have a word for this as well. It's called nintai, meaning patience. So yes, uh, so to boil it down, what is hyper-personalization really and how can it get you fired? Well, I think to be to be honest, both within uh, campaign-driven communication and within data-driven communication, you can indeed uh, spend too much time, you can indeed over-invest in personalizing. So if you find yourself too far uh, to the right on either of these particular uh, disciplines, uh, you might find yourself actually being sacked for doing uh, too much hyper-personalization. So I think the remaining question uh, for you to ask yourself, are you about to get sacked for doing hyper personalization? Excellent. Thank you so much. Great presentation and obviously touched the nerve because loads of questions are coming in. So we'll try to get through all the ones we can. Uh, Anonymous asks, so if you can get fired for hyper personalization, are there any good examples out there to prove this? <laughs> yes, uh, luckily uh, there are. Actually, on a on a Madfest event just a few uh, a few weeks ago, actually I presented together with a fashion uh, retailer Minto, uh, and also with FT.com, and they were showing brilliant uh, examples of this. And actually, to to the curve here on the left, you can almost uh, take a wild guess when they started implementing the customer lifecycle uh, programs for real. I think also the examples that uh, FT.com uh, was sharing uh, shows that this can indeed uh, be very, very profitable. They did also at the event share some of the uh, not so successful examples. Uh, we didn't get them fired uh, in, in this case, but they, because they were also actually able to present some of the uh, examples here with good ROI. So yes, it can definitely bring positive ROI. <laughs> Fantastic. Next question here again from someone quite shy, anonymous. Uh, so not over-investing in, in hyper-personalization can seem like a bit of a highbrow discussion. Have you got any concrete do's and don'ts? Yeah, so uh, I actually did, did uh, prepare for something like this. I'll, I'll see if the, if, if the slide sort of uh, can, can fit the, the bill here. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's uh, again, Going back to this uh, distinction uh, between uh, campaigns, uh, editorial campaigns following the yearly life cycle, you can say for for the campaigns, I'm not, I'm really not trying to argue that you should stop doing your campaigns because this is what brings uh, significant uh, value for a lot of, especially retailers out there, born out of the uh, sort of the uh, the, the advertising uh, tradition. Uh, I also suggest that you always do the simple personalization of the creative assets. So if you want to personalize on gender, for instance, that you should definitely do that also based on age. So the, the, the most common demographic, uh, definitely do the, uh, the, uh, the personalization there. Uh, when it comes to hyper personalization with your campaigns, I suggest that you uh, only do this uh, if, uh, for instance, on product feeds, if technology actually allows you to make this scale. Uh, when it comes to the customer lifecycle part, I think the most important part is that you actually start your customer lifecycle efforts to the to the left end of the spectrum because the time getting the timing right alone uh, from a, a customer centric perspective will bring a lot of relevance to the end customer so you don't necessarily have to go too far right you don't need to do it both triggered and personalized and hyper hyper everything in order to actually get the volume so it's much more interesting and much more um, valuable to to get a lot of personalization uh, up and running in lifecycle flows uh, in a short period of time than getting it super super personalized Fantastic. We're out of time. Thank you so much. Loads of information in a very short time period. So thank you again.